Good morning. Good morning. Uh, my name is Ian Trevithan. I'm excited to get to share with you this morning. Aaron jokes about being the poor man's Christine, and then I wonder, what does that make me? I, <laughs> thank you for being with me this morning. Um, in these first weeks of the new school year, we've been grounding ourselves in the how and the why we gather together to worship. This series of sermons has been called Tuning Our Hearts from the line from the hymn, Come Thou Fount, that says, tune my heart to sing thy praise. Our hearts and our minds and our bodies need to be tuned so that we can worship unencumbered. Christine reminded us how worship connects us to eternity, where all people gather in worship, bowing before the one good king. Aaron invited us to notice and respond to our ever-present God, who is present with us here and now. And Leisha taught us that the bodies in which we worship are the very site of God's redeeming love. This morning, I want to talk about how scripture works in us as both gospel and law, and to equip us to notice and respond to the way of the gospel. Uh, Second Timothy is the last book that's attributed to Paul. The Paul we encounter in this letter is in prison in Rome. He's been abandoned by many of his friends and associates, and uh, they've turned away from him in shame. He is almost certainly facing death at the hands of the state. Though many of his letters were addressed to churches, this one is written to a beloved mentee. So the tone is a little more personal. Uh, and frequently moves into exhortation, since this might be their last correspondence. A word he uses three times in this lectionary passage is gospel. In verse 8, he invites Timothy to join me in suffering for the gospel, relying on the power of God. For Paul, the gospel is precious enough that he's staking his life on it, and suggesting that Timothy should do the same. Gospel is language that we use all the time, um, and I want to meditate a little bit on what exactly that refers to. To be human is to be limited. We run up on our limits all the time. From having limited knowledge and perspective to facing limitations in our bodies, I turn 40 this week, and it's probably cliche to point out that my body is reminding me of my limitations more and more. <laughs> uh, who knew that hip flexors could be such an issue? <laughs> um, we're limited to in the way that we love, the way that we love God, ourselves, one another, and our world. Elsewhere, Paul writes, I do not do the good that I want to do, but the evil I don't want to do is what I do. Whew. I really identify with that. The ultimate human limitation is that we are going to face death one day. But the gospel proclaims a new thing, that Christ has uh, abolished death and brought life and immortality. Notice that the gospel is profoundly one-sided. Later on, um, as we are having the Eucharist together, celebrating Eucharist together, we'll say, Christ has died, Christ has risen, Christ will come again. The gospel is all of God's agency and not ours. There's nothing we add, no shoulds that we obey, no right actions that we accomplish for this new reality to come to pass. It's all grace. Take a moment to notice how you react to that. What does that make you think? What emotions does that surface in you? How do you experience the gospel that gives life and hope and freedom in your body? How does this one-sidedness make you feel? I confess that for a lot of my life, thought it was just too good to be true. And I still think that from time to time. 
I've believed that any forgiveness I've experienced is so that I would do better from then on. That is to say, I've made the gospel conditional. I've made it about my behavior, not Jesus's. If I follow the rules in the Bible, then God will love me. If I believe enough of the right things, then I'll be saved. If I'm straight passing enough, God has to reward me. If I eliminate all of my racist, sexist, homophobic, transphobic, ageist, ableist thoughts, I'll be worthy of God's kingdom. Suddenly, it's not sounding like good news anymore. I don't think I can actually do these things. When we add to the gospel, we make it conditional. When we make it Jesus's liberatory work and my right action, it's no longer good news. We've made a new law, either to try to prove ourselves or to force God's hand. See, you have to love me. I did all these things for you. As Nadia Boltz Weber says, under the law, there are two options, pride and despair. When fulfilling the shoulds is the only thing that determines our worthiness, we're either prideful about our ability to follow the rules compared to others, or we despair at our inability uh, to perfectly do anything. Either way, it's still bondage. Earlier, I asked you to notice how you might experience the gospel in your mind and body and heart. I'm not gonna prompt you to do the same when it comes to the despair that the law works. But does this sense of being bound resonate with you in a particular way as it does with me? Paul writes to Timothy to guard the good deposit, which is to say the gospel. I actually prefer the translation treasure, guard the treasure that is the gospel with the help of the Holy Spirit living in us. How do we do that when we come together to worship? For one thing, we remember and speak and sing about God's restoring love, restoring work in Jesus. A gift of the liturgy that we use is that it emphasizes God's agency over our response. Another thing that we do is we search our hearts. We're gonna notice pride and despair. Know that if that happens to you today, that's the norm and doesn't make you an exception. I wish that my younger self understood that better. And when we experience the pride and despair of being under the law, we can confess those things to God and one another, and we can set our hope newly on the promise that Jesus abolished death and brought life and immortality, and there's nothing that we can add to that. Finally, as we read scripture together, we can listen in a particular way that I wanna elaborate on briefly. An interesting thing happens when we read scripture on our own or here as we're gathered, it works on us as both law and gospel. Have you ever read the Bible and had your conscience bother you? Has it reminded you of how you've neglected God or how you've harmed someone that you love or that there's some good thing that you've neglected to do? That's the scripture working on us as law. And when that happens, it's ultimately God inviting us to humility by showing us our limits so that we might put our hope and trust in Jesus and not ourself or the things that we do. In the words of Martin Luther, God receives none but those who are forsaken, he restores health to none but those who are sick, he gives sight to none but the blind and life to none but the dead. He doesn't give saintliness to any but sinners, nor wisdom to any but fools. In short, he has mercy on none but the wretched and gives grace to none but those who are in disgrace.
When we read scripture together, it can speak the gospel to us again when we listen for the promise of the future that it speaks to us. Let's apply that for a moment to this second Timothy passage. Paul writes, I know the one in whom I've put my trust, and I'm sure he's able to guard the treasure I have entrusted to him. Because our lives are treasure to Jesus, because he is the guard of that treasure who overcame death to preserve us, and because we have the help of the Holy Spirit to remind us of the thing, these things when we forget. Therefore, the day is coming that we will stop striving to prove ourselves, that we will fully rest in the extravagance of God's love to us, that we'll be free to love without limitation. Take a moment to take that promise in. Consider or notice how that promise sits in your body. Do you feel a lightness, a sense of comfort, a feeling of freedom? These are the things that scripture works in us when it proclaims the gospel. In our worship together, the gospel has to be the main thing. There's a lot of good reasons why we might come together, but only one of them will bring life and freedom, and that's to keep the gospel at the center of our worship. In a moment, we're going to recite the creed. Notice whose agency is expressed there. Almost all of the verbs demonstrate God's action in the world to love. Only one verb expresses our agency, and that's to believe. And a little later, we'll celebrate the Eucharist in which Jesus gives his life, symbolized by bread and wine, and simply invites us to eat and to drink and to remember. Our one job is to receive the gift of the gospel as fully as our hearts can with the help of the Spirit. Let me close with a few stanzas of a hymn. Weary, working, burdened one, wherefore toil you so? Cease your doing, all was done long, long ago, till to Jesus' work you cling by a simple faith. Doing is a deadly thing, doing ends in death. Cast your deadly doing down, down at Jesus' feet. Stand in him, in him alone, gloriously complete. Amen.